In this episode in particular, I interviewed Ashana, an international artist who has created some incredibly therapeutic music using her voice and her crystal singing bowls. She shares some of her own journey with sound in her life and reveals some incredibly profound moments of transformation with sound and with her own practice. We also touch on topics such as the limits of classical training, ego within a heart-centered art form, and more. We enter this interview after me sharing to Ashana that it was rather random us conducting an interview uh, in the current situation. And what she starts to share is um, her feelings um, and experiences with what is happening right now. So enjoy this episode. And oh yes, at the end, you'll hear a beautiful offering from Ashana and the listening experience will change after hearing Ashana speak of her journey with sound. So please listen until the end and then enjoy that passive reception of healing sound. Enjoy. Um, I, it just amazes me how, how much people are hungry for, for anything and everything that can help them stay centered. I know I am in some ways, um, cause I'm, I'm so sensitive energetically as I'm sure you are mm -hmm. to cool. the emotional waves. And we live in a huge city too. We live in Phoenix, Arizona, which has about 6 million people and starting about like 10 days ago. It's like the, the entire grid of the city just amped up emotionally. And you, you can't miss, I can't miss it. And it goes in like these cycles of waves. I just noticed that there was another wave in the last 24 hours of where you just feel like anxiety and fear and worry and, and it just comes in like like this inside the collective of the grid of the city and so you know what practices do i use to ride that grid when i'm feeling it at you know this morning at one o'clock in the morning starting to roll right through me after i'd been asleep for two hours and um one of my teachers sent to all her students beautiful um, SoundCloud uh, link to Pema Chodron's Tonglen practice. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's a Buddhist teacher, yeah, yeah. American yeah. Buddhist teacher. And it was the, the practice. Were, the wisdom of no escape, that's what I remember her from. Yeah, well, she has a beautiful, well, there's a beautiful Buddhist practice called Tonglen, which is, where you, instead of like resisting the fear, you bring it right into your heart. You, you, you bring all the darkness inside of you and then you breathe out, you know, what you want to give. So that joy, that love, that light, that delight, mm -hmm. that, that appreciation, that gratitude, you know, so it just goes in and out. And when I was listening to her give this teaching, it was about an hour long, and I was listening to her do this and it's just the sound of her voice. And I didn't even care what she was saying, but the sound of her voice was entraining my nervous system. I could feel it. Mm -hmm. So by, by the time I stopped, I had, had to stop listening. I was like calm, just calm. Mm -hmm. So sound, sound is huge right now. Oh, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those, it's like there's, you know, I concur and just resonate with everything you've said, you know, in regards to these waves, because there'll be, you know, there'll be these moments whereby um, it kind of just feels like I'm, you know, just pot pottering along, you know, I'm just pottering yeah. along. And then other times I'm just like grateful, you know, for the space almost to like embrace the retreat mentality of being on retreat and allow 
whatever's happening collectively to me to process what my individual responsibility is within that and my own karmas and patterning and notice what happens there um but then also feeling that collective and then all of a sudden it can just be as you can it kind of just you know it kind of does literally feel like uh, when you're on a roller coaster and you kind of do that jump it kind of just whoop there whoop, there we go and then you know you can feel just the intensity of what's happening um very viscerally and, and bodily but it's interesting that you know the sounds you know just just listening to something how you know sound is an immediate state shifter mm -hmm. immediate. right it's an immediate state shift. It just shifts our state in that particular moment, mm -hmm. but then gives us an invitation to abide where sound has brought us. Yes, you know, that's so beautiful. I love what you said. I'm going to quote you on that. That is like <laughs> absolutely beautiful. That is so perfectly well said. Mm. So it's just not an, it's, it's not just an experience of this has happened. I've received this sound. It's made me feel this experience, and I get on. But it is that okay. It's like someone, you know, inviting you somewhere to a museum to look at this wonderful place. Look at all the pictures. Look at everything, and then it's up to you to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know, so sound is so potent in that way, um, and especially right now. Very much so. Mm. And my thing is, before I do a lot of work with the voice, so my thing is um, is the voice, using voice work to, to enter the depth space. That is so yeah. powerful. That's so powerful. I mean, I, I have had probably the deepest releases and shifts um, because of vocal, vocal work, you know, I mean, everybody knows me and my music and it's just like really, you know, pure angelic sound that we've, we, that's evolved. Uh, Thomas Barkey and my producer and I, and we just really evolved and cultivated this because it's just what happens usually when I, when I sit down to sing and play. But when I do my own vocal work, um, it's very raw. It's very gritty. It's very ugly a lot. Um, you know, this is the place where I can go to free up um, the stagnations and the trap places and to access, but it's also once that's opened up, once it's like once the pipes are cleared out, then there's space to to you know be in whatever that looks like. And and also it's an access point for me. It's often a very powerful access point to multidimensional um, planes. And I feel that I I do a lot of work in that regard, and I've done. On, in live con concerts and stuff, I've been doing more and more and more of that kind of work that, um, and that kind of vocal sound. People don't expect it of me, and but I, but I'm introducing it more and more and more. And what I'm noticing in in, in the live events is that people are having a tremendous depth of experience through that. I mean, it's just tremendous, the transformation, the the cutting through, the, you know, for, for, for me, it's just it's opening up this channel to just allow, and I, and I let go of any holds on my vocal sound. There's, there's nothing, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing that isn't okay inside of that sound context. Now, when I say that, it's in a it's in a container that has been created for deep safety, deep healing, and and very strong connection with the team. So it's not like I would sit in front of two hundred people and emotionally barf all over them. That's not what's happening. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. That's you know my responsibility. If I need to do that, then I go do that in my own 
right. and with the privacy of my own home. But right. in terms of like a, a concert setting or a healing work setting, you know, this is this is the deep vocal sound that just allows for. Um, I can't even describe it in words just specific and particular sounds and sounding to come through that that I th believe are designed to move energies through in in quite specific grids that are not necessarily known or understood by me inside that moment um, so to facilitate breaking down of patterns introduction of new frequencies and um, the cleansing and clearing and the realignment of consciousness in that moment. And my job is just to get the heck out of the way right. to the best of my ability and let all of that through. So what, what I'd like to ask is then, is you say, you know, cause I know you have a, a background in, you know, in your, you've been classically trained, you've had lots of training. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, without getting too much into necessarily the ins and outs of what that was, my, my what I'd, what'd be interesting for you to talk to is the how that has kind of set you up to do this work, but at the same time, how you've had you know what are the limitations of that training in the sense of the um, the shift of this position. Mm -hmm. from being classically trained to do the work you're doing. So essentially, in a nutshell, how did it set you up and serve the work you're doing in the world now, but also what have you had to sort of alchemize and transform due to the limitations of that training, if there were any or are any? Oh, there, there were huge limitations of training classically. And at the same time, um, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be able to do what I do now, you know, um, and I had to go through a lot of dismantling of it, uh, in order to show up more fully as myself. Um, but even when I say that, it's just, it's a really, it's a, it's a very inter interesting paradox because the training itself was very demanding and it was um, very limiting because the world of classical singing is, is, um, is stylistically oriented to create and cultivate a very particular sound and a very particular experience. Mm -hmm. And I was trained in a conservatory um, you know, classically, classical music conservatory. And so I studied opera and oratorio and art song and a lot of early music. And it was probably um, the combination of a lot of that that allowed me, uh, it wasn't probably, it, it was the combination of, of a lot of that that actually allowed me to create something like Ave Maria, you would never hear that mm -hmm. without that level of classical training because that voice that, you know, people, a lot, some people really, they think that there's a classical singer on there that's not me singing that. Mm -hmm. And people are usually in shock when, that, when I go, no, that was me. I sang that, you know, um, because they go, well, oh my God, you know, we, because the rest of the time I never sing like that, right? So there was that piece of it, and, and there was just you know many, many, many years of singing um, uh, in the early music scene in New York City um, with just some of the best of the best. I was very fortunate and blessed to be trained by a lot of the best of the best singers in early music and, and musicians in early music at that time in New York City. So in the in the 1980s and the 90s. And um, I got to a certain point in my in my training. I had I had left New York and I uh, moved to to California. 
and everything started changing. And I will never forget this. This was one of the most, it was a seminal point in my, in my life as an artist when I had been invited to sing for an ordination at a, at a, a ministerial ordination for a group of ministers that were being ordained. And they asked me to sing Amazing Grace. But the pianist that was playing for me was a jazz pianist. And he was gorgeous. He was from London, by the way. And, um, and I started singing. And there was something inside of me that just hit critical mass like this. And I basically just went, <laughs> you know? And I, was, and I was like, I am not doing this like this anymore it was just like i'm done and i just want to freaking sing and and i looked at him and i just said i i i have i just have to sing and i opened my mouth and i just started you know singing like a jazz singer like a pop singer and improvising you know and i finished and everybody in the room just kind of went what was that, you know? Cause it was like, Ashana, as we knew it, she wasn't there anymore. So it was, it was like a taste and that was like a taste of it. And, and you know, when, you, when we have moments like that, it's, it's not black and white. You don't just like go through and then say, okay, I've, I've broken through and now no, I'm on the other yeah, side. Yeah. It was like, I broke through for 10 minutes and then I pulled back and then, but I started reevaluating. So I spent a whole period of, I don't know, 10, 15 years where I, I trashed all, I, I just got rid of all my classical music. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of this. And I just dived, went face into um, learning cover tunes and pop music and, and, and singing in a jazz trio and singing, you know, and I just started just like going like this to find, you know, something else. And were you, at this time, were you engaged in sadhana? Were you engaged in spiritual practice at this time? No, not real. I mean, sort of. I would have to say those were my beginning years. I mean, I'd, I'd started yoga in, in, when I was in conservatory, actually. But I was not conscious of what I was doing. Yeah, I was, right. I was pretty shut down, you know, I'm really... I'd have to say my 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 really deeper awakenings didn't start happening until you know about 20 years ago. It, you know, I I I think somebody like me in this I would call myself like the second wave of sound healers that have come in. You know, people like you, you're coming in on like a third wave. Uh, and, and we had to lay a lot of ground. It was really dense. The ener energetically, like crystal bowls, when I first started playing crystal bowls, nobody knew what they were. And all we had were the classic frosts. And, you, and, and, and there was no training. There was, there was nothing telling you, do this, don't do this. I, I made so many mistakes with crystal singing bowls and people and sound because of my, my, my pride and my hubris and my, and my arrogance, you know, thinking, well, you need this and you have to do this and I have to play like this. And if you don't like the way I play, it was just like, oh my God, if I could go back and apologize to all the people that, that I played for, you know, in my first, like, three to five years of playing. I would, I would absolutely do that. Um, there was just this learning curve of... So you're, what you're now talking about is um, essentially a different type of training that was occurring. Oh, yeah. It was you totally know, you know, uh, And, you know, I'm, maybe you can speak to how that develops and how formal, I mean, I don't like the word formal, but how, let's say, um, rigorous it was or prescribed it was, but necessarily prescribed based on the context in which it was happening. You know, do's and don'ts, caveats, contraindications, um, philosophy, science, you know, all of that, you know, because it's, it's still a new thing in the world, 
But when your training started, how did that start to take shape? Which training are you talking about? You're talking with about sound. classical with training? Sound. No, 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 with sound now, because now you're going into the different, when you, because you said you made lots of mistakes and you wish you'd go back. What, yeah. what, what, then, what then happened? What then happened to the point where actually you felt that there was a different learning process with sound occurring? Like what, how did that look? Oh, it, 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 it really, well, let me just say this. It, 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 it's probably helpful to understand that I've been probably the most reluctant sound healer on earth. You know, everybody, I can't tell you. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I, I came to the Crystal Singing Bowls as an artist, as a musician. Mm. I didn't come to them from sound healing. To me, they were instruments that accompanied vocal sound. And yeah. I held on to that. I mean, really, like, like this, uh, with my, with you know, with a grip of iron. I held on to that idea and that concept for many, many years when I was starting because I never, I never saw myself as a sound healer. I always just saw myself first and foremost as a musician, as an artist, and as a singer. And the bowls were were beautiful but the funny thing about it was is that they were just working on me they were working on me the bowls were working on me the sounds were working on me the artistry was working on me the mantras were working on me the 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 opportunities of sharing all of this with others worked on me every recording that i did worked on me excuse me worked on me to dismantle you know layers upon layers of my egoic structure it was just it it was relentless in uh, you know the, my soul's gift to me of 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 sound and music was i believe very specifically designed to help me have the experience of humility and the release of spiritual arrogance mm -hmm. and and the opening of um, the opening of a more tangible direct connection to source than than the soul had experienced in i don't even know how many lifetimes that and sound afforded that, has afforded that to me, where it's not Hindu spirituality. Although I I do I deep dive study a Sanskrit mantra. It's it's something that is very that I'm very um, engaged in and passionate about is in that study. Or it's not yogic, it's not Buddhist, it's not you know because I spent many years in the Kundalini yoga community, it's not Sikh and Gurumukhi. You know, it's, it's not shamanic. It's not, uh, you know, Pleiadian or Lemurian. Because for me, when I look and, and I engage deeply into all of them, I still, at the core, want to bypass the system and the structure and go direct. And that's been my driving desire, um, probably since I was a very, very little girl and I didn't even realize it. And I just, and so I would absorb and connect with all of these different systems and structures. And, and then eventually I'd be left with the dogma and, and I'd be left at, with, with being dependent on a guru, a teacher, um, a practice in order to make that connection. And there was something inside of me where I just wanted the freaking connection mm -hmm. and I didn't want all of the accoutrement around it. And, and, and I, I, I will never forget the, the, um, one of, one of the most profound times that I had was when I was 
I was on tour and I'd been, I'd been recording and I, and I'd been touring significantly and I was exhausted and I'd been playing bowls just a lot, a lot, a lot. My nervous system was not tolerating. I wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't know at that point in time in my career how to handle the continuous playing of bowls and holding space for people. I, I was not, um, I didn't have the t tools or the skill set to be able to do that. And so I started breaking down and, and there, of course there's grace in the breaking down, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was at that point and I was with my, my, uh, my tour manager and was also my, one of my best friends. And we were in, uh, we were in Utah and she's this amazing, my friend, Diane, she's this amazing, um, nature connection. She's super kapha, really grounded. And, you know, I'm like airy out there like this. And, and I was starting to break down. I was, I was starting to just literally my nervous system was, was could no longer tolerate it. I was breaking down. I was sobbing. I was crying. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't play any more bowls. I can't, I mean, I was so out there energetically that I wasn't in my body anymore. And she drug me to Capitol Reef State Park in Utah, which is an incredibly beautiful place. And I was walking down these paths, we were hiking. And I was walking down and I was sobbing. I was tears were rolling down my face. And I crawled into a cave. So I was surrounded in the womb of Mother Earth. I mean, it really, you, I, maybe you could have touched it about this. It was like a shelf rock, but the recess was deep and I crawled way back into the recess and I could see the sun and I was sitting there and I could feel my whole energy field and my nervous system starting to ground. And I was, and I started meditating, I was sitting there, meditating and I heard the voice clairaudiently of a teacher that I have worked with for many years and I, who I love deeply. And I heard her say, clairaudient to me, source, absolute. And it was like this massive wake up call for me in that moment where I was disconnected from source, absolute, and that that was the one longing of my soul on every level. Mm. There I was like in the belly of the earth being told by my teacher, just go to the source. So it had nothing to do with going outside of yourself and nothing to do with reaching. It was just coming back home right inside. And those words have rung in my consciousness from that moment on. So sound broke me down. You know, if, if it hadn't been for the sound, if it hadn't been for everything that I'd done just organically and unconsciously, I don't know that I would have gotten to that moment. So there's, there was a, a deep intimacy, a deep intimacy, a deep relationship with sound. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't even realize that that's what was happening. I'm realizing it now. Mm -hmm. you know, and this is like, it's been such an in, intense evolution for me. So there's been the, the really beautiful ecstasy of singing. And, and there's nothing in my life that compares to that. You know, when, when I have those moments of singing and it's just truly complete soul there's nothing 
holding that back. And many, many times, you know, most of the recordings that we have are, those are the moments that are captured that you hear, you know, or is, is because it's, it's quiet enough, it's still enough. And Thomas and I have been working together so many years. I mean, we have just 15 years of, of friendship and connection. And so when, when I'm in the studio, it's just a matter of going deeper and deeper into the silence. Mm. And so I have the space to do that. And, and then it comes out, you know, in these moments in, in the recording. And then there's the live events where now, you know, I, I make very clear choices to sink into deeper levels of transparency and vulnerability because honestly it's not worth singing if you don't go there so just things that you just shared you know obviously there's no there's no manual you can just go and find for that <laughs> No manual. There's no, no. There's, there's, no there's no certification program. No. <laughs> there's no certification. There's no certification. So, oh my so, god, no. Oh. So what it sounds like, what's interesting is that so obviously I do um, as I said before, I do the voice work, but I also do do music and I you know just uh, finished the mantra album. And I've been just in a process recently of just thinking about what I wanted to create next. Uh -huh. right? And I, I have my idea, but it's this, but I've also been going through this personal as well as spiritual process whereby I'm really being drawn into how much of what I'm doing is for me. Yeah, how much of what I'm doing is for me and how much of what I'm doing is for me and everyone. <laughs> You know, and in terms of just this real, just soul and heart submission and handing over my own creativity to the divine. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you hand it over. Well, it's this, you know, it's like a submission. It's fe what's feeling like is like a, it's, it's a sense of I don't own it. Right. You know. That's what I mean. I don't own it. So in sense of like, I have this thing, I have this skill, whatever it is that's developed over my life and, and, and continues to. Just the same for many artists. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, this tussle between where does, and I don't really like using the word ego, but where does ego or self-referencing, where does self-referencing stop and what you described where there's that absence of there is an absence of self-identification and there is an absorption in the process with with sound and with voice and with chant that unfolds and there's this um transformative process that i'm that i'm assuming you know, any sacred artist has to go through or will go through or continue to go through in terms of that process between self-referencing and heart with a capital H. Yeah, and, and, and you used a couple of words that I, that, um, I really liked, you know, that, and one being the self-referencing, um, as a process and the process of, of moving from self-referencing to absorption. And that, see, that's the word I think that's critical here. It's, uh, it's about becoming absorbed. And what are you becoming absorbed in? Becoming, in my experience, I'm, I'm coming, becoming absorbed into the sound itself which then becomes the no sound. And it, and it 
blossoms into this pregnancy of, of I don't know, I don't know the words for it. It's this pregnancy, it's this rich, spacious, expansive, listening at a really deep level and this giving, but it doesn't even feel like giving. It's just this expression of the creative flow that is an isness and a beingness inside this state. I can't even call it of connection because connection implies that there's one plus two, but inside this state, there's nothing. There's just the isness of it. And, that, and inside that consciousness, you know, that, that, that's a place where I want to be and I love being when I'm singing from that place. But am I in that place all the time? No. You know, a lot of times I'm still going through my own issues around self, as you say, self-referencing. But it's this, instead of it being a bad thing, or a not as good as this thing. Mm -hmm. It is the process of acknowledging, loving, accepting, and bringing that in and just going, going, oh, you know, right now I'm thinking about, I don't even know, you know, whatever it is that, that could be running through your mind. You know, it depends if I'm self-referencing when I'm in a room full of people and I catch myself watching somebody go into the bathroom and think, oh, am I not doing so well? You know, or uh, or I'm I'm recording and I'm thinking, wow, was that good enough? You know, <laughs> what, you know, is the yeah. sound really, is that the sound I really want? Is that in tune? Is that, you know, is that real? And if I'm asking those questions, I'm obviously not in the absorbed place, but what you, what I can't do, um, or I have say, not that I can't do it, but what is unhelpful inside that moment is to um, judge myself for being where I am in that moment. So it becomes this practice. Instead of a process, it becomes the practice. It becomes its own sadhana. Mm -hmm. it becomes a sadhana of awareness and of attention mm -hmm. and just acceptance right. you know, and care because there are going to be plenty of times when you're absorbed but there's also going to be lots of times when you're not and how do you hold that with gentleness you know how do you hold that in a space where you're okay with yourself when when you're in the self-referencing place mm -hmm. and you're doing some a concert or a sound sound healing experience for a hundred people, 200 people or whatever people in the room, you know, it's okay. And so I think once we disconnect the judgment or the expectation that we have to be this idea or this concept of a spiritually perfect sound healer or a spiritually perfect musician because once you put it's really weird once you put that name that that label on ourselves where you say i'm a sacred chant artist i'm a mantra singer wow you you know i'm a classical singer I'm a, you know, I sing pop, you know, whatever it is. Once the label yeah, goes on, but especially I find in classical singing and in, and in the sacred vocal music scene of, you know, yoga and chant, once you put that label on, there's a whole lot of baggage that gets laid on that. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be angelic. You got to be quote unquote pure. You have to be seen as, you know, I have to tell people all the time, please do not put me on a pedestal. I don't belong there. I don't want to be there. I am not your angel floating in a cloud. Yeah, I'm a Shauna. Yeah. I poop like everybody else. Yeah. I have bad days. I get cranky. I get crabby. I get very pissed off at times. You know, um, my voice can get really loud and loud and brash. I can be prideful. I can be, you know, funny. I can be loud. I can be soft. I can be sexy. I can be, you know, I'm all of that. 
and I'm yes, and I sing mantra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Right? I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, cause that's you know, cause it's you know, yeah, yeah. I I, I totally resonate with that. Cause because it's just the spectrum of human experience, and there'll be times where there's yeah. just these absorbed devotional you know, states, but then there's these times where, you know, you'll be with your friends and you'll be chatting garbage or whatever, you know. It's <laughs> you remember that, I don't know if you ever saw that movie, it's called Michael with John Travolta and he was, he was like the Archangel Michael oh, and he came okay. to and the opening scene of that thing is him like chowing down on cornflakes and milk and spooning what you know spooning and eating out of the box and going out with a whole bunch of babes and it was like yeah. the best it was the best because you know we have these crazy ideas i think about you know being a sacred vocal artist or you know doing chant and and the chant is there to serve us? The, mm -hmm. the chant is there to, to 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 teach us absorption. Is to teach us our oneness and our connection, but also saying yes to all of life, not yes to this idea of spiritual perfectionism, which is yeah. very unhelpful and very unreal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, for sure. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, and it doesn't, and and in a lot of ways, you know, I, and I'll, I'll say this for real, but in a lot of ways, recorded music can can be deceptive because inside a recording process, you know, you get the best of the best of Ashana inside a recording, right? You know? And and that and in a in, in a high energy you know, um, concert situation, you get the best of the best of me mm -hmm. when I really have dove into the energy and the audience is like, oh yeah, and everything is, you know, alive. But there's all these hours that don't ever even remotely look like the best of the best, you know, when I'm trying to figure out my voice or, you know, I wake up in the morning and I can't chant to save my life. And, you know, I'm doing a mantra and I'm thinking of a grocery list at the same time. You know, it's right. like, you know, and and that's the grist for the mill. Mm. That, uh, those are the moments where I catch myself and I go, oh, where am I? And is that where I want to be? You know? mm. And am I judging myself for being there in that moment? If I catch that, if I can catch that one iota of self-judgment in the moment, to me, that's like, oh, you know, thank you. Thank yeah. You, you know? Mm. Anyway, I mean. Yeah, my, my wife would really appreciate that because I'm always, I'm always doing vocal stuff, like in the shower or like. <laughs> I'll be doing funny things with my voice, like doing the little massage. And she's like, babe, will you just stop? You're fine. Your voice is fine. It sounds fine. <laughs> just stop. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, I mean, I like doing, I, I'm doing this stuff all the time. <laughs> right. She's like, I have a tick. She's like, babe, is that a tick? Is that a tick in your room? <laughs> you just now developed a tick with all this singing. <laughs> um, oh, I want to ask because you, you've done um, you know you spoke about your recording yeah. and you've done tracks songs um, and we're from different traditions yeah um, just just before the call I was actually listening to uh, Grieleso oh which, so yeah good. So me, my wife is a Greek Cypriot. So yeah. Yeah, she's Greek Cypriot. So family has a Greek Orthodox um, background. Mm -hmm. And actually, for our wedding, we uh, we have a, a friends of ours who um, called um, Illumina, and they and they sung their own version of um, just Gidi Lesson as me and my wife as my wife was coming down the aisle. Oh God, that must be beautiful. Oh, it was. It was. It was. It was. It was a moment. Just seeing her come down and hearing that was uh, was was something that will stay with oh. me for forever. 
It was very, very beautiful, awesome. very sacred. And a lot, a lot of people were there because of the way that we, because we constructed the ceremony together. Um, they said, um, oh, you know, like, like solid, like, oh. Greek, but I feel spiritual. I feel spiritual. <laughs> you know? I feel spiritual. Uh, but that started <laughs> off with this like invocation and that feeling of yeah. like, real depth space that we would we could open up. But my, my question is, how, how do the because I, I I'm assuming you don't just you know pick something willy nilly, but then how does the relationship to the culture, the sacred culture that it comes from, lead to then a track? Oh. Um. That's a really good question. Uh, well, some of it, let me put it this way. I don't record anything unless it feels authentic to me. So there has to be a dial-up. There has to be uh, and it can't be as like a thin thread. It has to be a, a solid beam of light that takes me from one to the other. And I was raised uh, Christian in a Protestant family. My father's side was Russian Orthodox. My mother's side is American United Methodist Church. And that's how I ended up. But we lived in the Bronx in New York City in the 1950s and 1960s, because when I was born in 1956. And all of our neighbors were Jewish. So I went to a Hebrew af day school, after school, um, after school care. And Passover seders and, you know, I learned how to make latkes and play spin the dreidel with my friends. And, you know, when I was six years old, I was going to marry Ira Fox, who lived next door. So uh, I had a very strong Judeo-Christian upbringing, <laughs> you know, meaning Judeo and Christian. <laughs> and my first husband was Jewish, and I married him under a huppah. So my, my mom and my dad were very much liberal uh, New Yorkers. And so even though they, my mom had a, a very fairly conservative Christian bent, she was also extremely open-minded. So one summer I went to uh, Finnish Bible camp because my best friend was from Finland and her name was Millie Madden it lived down the block and I learned to sing Heavenly Sunshine in Finnish so <laughs> you know this was a New York City kid and I I went to as I grew up and grew older I went into ashrams and I learned that experience I went into um, uh, sweat lodges I had those experiences. I, I, I never had a place inside of my, my, uh, my upbringing, which was an amazing blessing for my parents. T for them and for me, all paths were welcome. So I was hardwired that way. <clears throat> and, and I spent in the Kundalini Yoga community, I, I, I was very blessed um, with being able with it with a with a profound experience the first time I I heard Gurumukhi um, prayed inside the Gurdwara and I I had a complete soul revelation from past lives and I knew I was there and I broke down I mean I had had a third eye visions of I mean, I was in my Kundalini yoga class and walked up to my teacher and I said who is this guy with the 
uh, you know, he's got a long white beard and he wears orange because he come to me in a meditation like the day before. And she looks at me really strangely. She goes, oh, that's Guru Nanak. And I'm like, oh, okay. And in my mind, I'm like, whatever. Right? <laughs> I was like the first Sikh guru. And, and things like, you know, I don't think, I don't really see that as unusual because I don't have those kinds of visions all the time, but when they come, they're very prevalent. So when I was recording the only Kundalini Yoga album that I did called River of Light, um, Guru Nanak's presence was very much there for me. And so all of the pieces that I chose were pieces that had resonance with me. And when I did the album Beloved, um, I was told by my team that I needed to record the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And I was like, you're kidding, right? And I avoided it for months. I was like, Aramaic, you're joking. I mean, I, I, am I going to wrap my mouth around this? And, and it was like insistent. No, you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. And so I finally, months later, I just said, okay. And it took me about six weeks of listening to Coptic Christians chant in the Aramaic and dismantled it down. And I did my very best at the time. I've studied a little bit more since then. And I love to go back and fix my pronunciation, but I can't and it's okay. Cause the intention's there, mm-hmm. um, you know, but the, and I had a profound transcendent experience recording that song because I just like, I go like this. I really, I surrender. Same thing with when I did Aham Prema. I mean, it was, that was the energy of the divine feminine. We're coming out with some really amazing new music very soon. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, Sanskrit mantra, which I've been studying in depth for the last uh, few years. So, and, and why am I doing that? I mean, again, it was when I think about it, I mean, I had a dream and I was told to, uh, by one of my spiritual teachers. She brought me to meet somebody. And I saw this man sitting there with his students. And he gave a big smile on my face. And he said, welcome. And, and um, I went and I searched on the internet. And I knew he was like some kind of mantra teacher. And I went and I searched on the internet. And I saw his picture. And I went, that's the guy. been studying with him ever since <laughs> you know so I don't mm. pick these things randomly yeah yeah, yeah. there's a connection there's a resonance and it and it comes in I think all, all artists are if you one a long long time ago so, a singer songwriter that I had met in passing so it's not somebody I know now you know I heard her say, or I read something, and she said, and she said, well, you know, that she had, she never had a connection with, it didn't matter what she sang, she never had a connection with it, it wasn't important. And I am like the complete opposite end of that scale. If I cannot sing whatever I'm singing with authenticity, if it doesn't feel real and honest and true to me, then I have no business singing it. I cannot sing it. Mm-hmm. It's possible that literally I can do the vocals, but the voice as an instrument of passion and heart, it doesn't work. Yeah. But this morning, right? This morning I was in the shower and I was singing that beautiful gospel hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Yeah. His eye is on the sparrow. Roll. Okay. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. And, 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 you know, 
And I was, and my heart just was like, <gasps> because I was feeling the refrain in that song that, you know, there's the, the language in there. With Jesus as my portion, no finer friend is he. And I was feeling that and I was like, oh my goodness, for so many people, it doesn't have to be Jesus. It could be Buddha with Buddha as my friend, no finer friend is he, with Krishna, with Lakshmi, with, with you know, with, with the divine as my friend, with illumination as my friend, you know, pick the word that works for you. And it's the, and why was I thinking of that song? Because I was thinking of that. Why do I sing? I sing because I'm happy. And that music, that music in the African-American tr tradition, it was like the, the, the vibration of the song uplifted and took away all of the stuff. It was the it was the entrainment of the nervous system to say, you know, I'm I'm beyond the space of the consciousness of this reality, and I am living in an expanded state of beingness. I sing because I'm happy. <laughs> Makes me cry just thinking about the state of expansion, and that's. That's where the music lives. And, and that's where the music just like yeah. rips open the heart. And, 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 and the consciousness of the Christ consciousness with Jesus as my portion or Buddha or whoever it is you want. That state of expanded light, expanded love, divine intelligence, the source, the absolute, just pours through, and you can't help yourself because you sing because you're happy. <sighs> and I thought to myself, oh man, I'd love to record that. <laughs> just in that moment, it was just like, Oh. Yeah, yeah, I bet, I bet it's one of those, add it, add it to the list. <laughs> yeah, it, then that's it right, the like add it to the list, you, you know? know, and yeah. it might, I might never ever record a, you know, and another, another, amazing, another African spiritual, it's not really a spiritual, it's a gospel song, um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I would probably wouldn't do an, an, another single one. Mm. But I, I would, and then I would have to go into the studio, and we would replicate, it and then you, you know, all the pieces of that. Yeah. Are the, is that the right piece? I mean, I've been singing Amer "Amazing Grace" as an encore for, in my concerts for a long, long time. We can't record it. It's impossible. We tried, and we tried re getting me on recording, and it was just like, Thomas was yeah, just like, "Thomas, right. this is not going to work." Well, it's meant to be, yeah. No, it's because it's not meant to do that. Mm. And, you know, and yeah, there was, um, you know, there's these moments that can just, just like what you just described, and uh, it seems like I don't know if you resonate with this, it seems like it's just a moment of something coming through, but it's not just that moment, it's this whole what else has been happening in the background of our own beings, like the breakthrough that you said, these are just kind of like little mini. Oh, like flowers that come through. Like I'm a um, primary school teacher, and I was walking in the corridor, and there was a there was a singing assembly going, and I, it just stopped me. There was a song they were singing, and it stopped me because I was listening to the children and listening to the harmony. I was like, "Oh, that is lovely. I want to do that. What is this song?" So I spoke to the teacher after, and she told me, and it's just this. Um, is this this the very simple? It's throw catch, jikaleza. Ah, oh, uh -huh. and I heard it, and I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that because I do circle singing as well. I was like, I want to create that as a circle song. You know, I think it would be lovely. And I was just so happy. And the kids throw catch, throw catch, throw catch, jikaleza. <laughs> na 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 na. I know where they're going. All of a sudden, you're in this place. <laughs> 
And it was just like, oh my God, it makes me feel happy. Um, and it's just those things, you know, you just, but that's like a whole connection to something greater than what just yeah. appeared in that moment through the yeah. entirety of that cult, the culture in which it came from, humanity, and then obviously whatever's happened in my experience to allow me to then meet that for this flowering to come, to come, to come through. So yeah, I resonate with what you're sharing about your connection with the different um, songs and lyrics and cultures that that, mm -hmm. that, that you that you're connected with. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of we... checking our time here, just so yeah. just to make sure that we. So I've got an, I've got something else happening. Oh, what time? What have you got to go in like now? I've got to go, it's like two, so I have to prep for another interview. So I just want to make sure that we're we're in our um, little container here. Okay. So, so we can just, finish up then if you've got to prepare. Get about 10 minutes. Okay, that. so what I was wondering is, if just two minutes, if you could, I'm going to ask another question. And after that, yeah. would you be able to do some bowls and some voice on offering? Uh, is that possible or not? I'm not going to do... Like that's fine. I'm not going to do that, right? I I'll do some bowls for you. I'm not going to do any singing right now. Okay, that's fine. Um, I usually don't like to, um, I'm just not set up for that. So no, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so, um, but the, before you do a bit of bowl, my question is, if you could just, just briefly suggest, maybe just some inspiration, but right now what's happening in the world, how, the voice and our relationship to our voice and how we can use our voice can support us individually and collectively right now? Oh, well, I would say that the number one thing that we need to do, well, not the number one thing, there are many things we need to do besides take care of ourselves really deeply, mm -hmm. be mindful of what's happening for other people um, and do our best to support and serve Mm -hmm. and, and where's appropriate but as far as like it, the whole piece about voice and vocals and what's happening you know remember that every word you speak and every sound you make has a direct impact on your nervous system and on the nervous systems of people around you so the sound of your voice and the words you say have a tremendous effect so everybody listening to this whether you're a singer whether you're a musician whether you chant whether you do yoga whether you are a healer be deeply conscious of the words you say right now be deeply conscious. Those words are vibrations and they are sound. And those sounds have a direct effect on the energy field and the nervous system of everyone who hears that. So are you speaking words that are calming, that are uplifting, that are helping someone release and relax tension? Or are you speaking words of fear, of contraction, of overwhelm, of anxiety? And I think we need to be very mindful of this. I got a text from a healer that I love very much yesterday. And the last two sentences of her texts were, you know, we are in a war zone right now with this. And I wrote her back and I said, be mindful of what you are creating with your words and be mindful of what you are saying to your patients because this is not helpful. We're not creating war, we're creating transformation. We're creating healing. We're creating a space for people to go within and shift at a really deep level. I think that's really important. The second piece, which is directly 
impacting everybody is we're in a time right now of great emotional um, waves. We talked about that when we first started, how these waves of emotion are, are profound for all of us. And they get stuck in our body, all of these waves. So if you feel the need to put on your favorite music and sing as loud as you can and dance and move, that is fabulous because it's actually shedding and shredding and shaking off a lot of both your own personal emotions that are going on, but the collective emotions that are happening around in your community and in your families and in your friends um, that you are feeling, whether you are aware of it consciously or not. So sound and vibration can really help discharge, cleanse and clear and rebalance the emotional body. And, and that's why we dance together. That's why we sing together. That's um, among other reasons. But this is one of the great, great benefits of music and sound in a time like this. We can tap into our own joy. We can tap into our sense of fun. We can tap into our knowingness that on some level beyond where the conscious mind lives, everything really truly is going to be all right. And so pick your favorite song, crank up the volume and go for it and try to maybe do that once a day, or at least if you're in the car, you know, or if you're walking around with your headphones on, I mean, you know, here in the U.S., in Phoenix, there, there, there is rumors right now. We have heard for the last couple of days that the, you know, our governor is about ready to close down the state to, pardon me, all non-essential business. Everybody gets to stay home now. So if we're home for two weeks, you know, you, you're a captive audience to all the great music that you could possibly sing and dance to. So why not spend five minutes or 10 minutes a day gifting that to yourself? Yeah. You feel better, you you're recharge your, 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 your energy, your emotions will lighten up, you'll touch your joy, you'll entrain yourself to the love that you are. Yeah. Make sure you pick uplifting music and, yes. and not depressing and you know stuff like that that's not i don't think that's very helpful at this time but yeah, sure. have some fun and use your voice and you know and then the third thing i'll say about that and then i really will be done with this subject um is that if you find yourself um, contracting you know lock yourself in the bathroom or the bedroom close the door and if you ha if you can't make a lot of noise around you put your face in a in a pillow so you can breathe and just let out noise let give yourself full permission to just express the frustration express the sound shake off the anxiety vocally that will be a tremendous help, even if you don't know how to use your voice or what yeah. to do with it. Just give yourself permission to give the anxiety, to give the fear of voice, to give the worry, give it a place. And you can start, you know, you can start really small and just make a sound that, ooh, you know, whatever that is and, and let that grow. It's also wonderful for bringing in more life force energy to the body because you'll you'll have to breathe and take deep breaths to do some of that kind of yeah. process. And that's wonderful for the nervous system. So these are three really simple ways to use your voice to feel wonderful. better. Wonderful. I'm sure anyone who listens to that will be deeply appreciative and um, also to have the permission to just while out in their bedroom with oh yeah baby <laughs> i was wondering if i could share you know a website and stuff like that so that yes you know so if, um you know if you love this and this was helpful to you in any way shape or form you know i have lots of music and we're getting ready to release an amazing product called celestial sleep uh, in about three weeks, um, you know, maybe four, 
that's it's actually quite revolutionary it's a combination of sound and vibrational healing and gentle hypnosis suggestions mm -hmm. and gorgeous music all put into one um, to help you with anxiety and healing and to get a really deep restful night's sleep so that's coming up from us and then we have another project that's getting ready to release which is an online course for healing the feedback on it is phenomenal um, we are having people having major health transformations um, through the use of this work and this these sounds and then we have jewels of silence 2 which is already in the can mm. and get to be released and it is gorgeous yes yes and, please and then some <laughs> other projects I, I keep telling people i was creatively constipated and now they're all coming out <laughs> wow. musical flow here a so sonic, a sonic enema <laughs> a sonic enema so um you know feel free to come and join us at soundofashana.com for and uh, you can sign up you can get some free music and um facebook and instagram i'll put all, all of the links we're everywhere i'll put all of the links connected with this so everyone can connect with all this wonderful work you're doing and all of the work that you've already done you know especially you know just to take one of your because now that we have spotify and things like that people don't tend to do this but yeah. you know, like when i was you know you take a cd or a vinyl and you listen to the whole journey people don't tend to do it as much with spotify but to really take some of one of your oh, yeah. listen to the journey that the artist intended you to go on uh and i'm definitely anyone who's listening to this do it with um some of ashana's work Jewels of Silence is incredible. I'd say it transports you somewhere, but it transports you again, like we spoke earlier. So a place within yourself that you can drop into and spend some time in. So, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Thank you. So you're so welcome. I'm just, again, checking my That's time. Fine. Yeah, let's... I'm going to have to go, but my bowl and I send you much, much love and appreciation for this opportunity mm. to share with your audience. So. Thank you Thank so much. And I hope at some point, who knows, to see you in person at some point. If you ever come over to London and bring your work over here. Oh, well, we've been trying. It just hasn't happened yet. But so, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens in the future. Thank you again. Okay, you're welcome. Bye-bye.